Good morning and welcome to another episode of The Legal Zone where we tackle injustice. Today we have another amazing show. Last week, I think, was perhaps one of the most influential shows that we've had to date. Over 28,000 views came in and the responses that I was getting about how some people felt betrayed by the media, how people started to see a, a young man in Mr. Simpson in a different light, all because information was not adequately shared in the public. And we're gonna get more into that later. But let me jump right into the beginning section for our law students and people studying to take the bar. Last week, we talked about freedom of speech. It's a fundamental right, freedom of press, fundamental right. Well, there's another fundamental right that we have in this country. And that's the freedom to practice religion. It's found in the First Amendment of the Constitution, and it's, it has two parts. There's the Establishment Clause and the Free Exercise Clause. Establishment Clause, Free Exercise Clause, remember that. The Establishment Clause has three parts, really. It primarily means that the government or state, when we talk about government, we're all talk, also talking about states individually. They cannot set up a church. Two, it means that they cannot pass laws that would aid a religion over another religion. And three, they cannot influence a person to practice religion or they can't force a person to practice a religion. This is where the whole no prayer in schools come in. They can't force in public schools. They cannot force an individual to pray. They can give a moment of silence and you could do whatever you want during that silence, sleep, meditate, pray, but they can't force. The second part of the religious freedom clause is the free exercise clause. And the free exercise clause prohibits the state or government from passing, law, passing laws that prohibit the free exercise of religion. And as with the free speech and free press, there are certain limitations, but there's also special privileges that fall under this umbrella of religion. Um, there's religious exemptions. In some states, you don't have to go to school if it's against your religious practice. <laughs> We see also the religious exemption with the COVID-19 vaccine. You could perhaps in the government not be made to take the vaccine if it interferes with your religious beliefs. Another example, in every state, it is a crime to have more than one wife or husband, more than one spouse, bigamy or polygamy. It's a crime punishable by jail time. And the Supreme Court held in Reynolds v. United States that people cannot avoid the law based on their religion. But there's a fine line because we know that still in this country, there are religions or religious sects that practice polygamy. How are they doing it? And should they be doing it? And what sort of powers or abuse comes with the practice of religion? That's what we're gonna be talking about today. Again, our guest from last week, we have Steve Singler. And today with Steve, we have his wonderful, beautiful wife, Joyce, who is also a journalist. And together they have delved into this subject of violence and religion. You would think that they would never intersect, but unfortunately they do. Mr. and Mrs. Singler, so glad to have you on our show today. Thank you for having us. Thanks. Now, talk to us about this, this, this issue of violence and religion. Well, given everything you just laid out there, I mean, I'll, I'll give a little bit of a preface because when I worked on the book, Talk to Death, which we talked about last week, with this group, the order, I mean, they had embraced a kind of perverse religion called identity Christianity. And this has surfaced a number of times actually since then that they believe that they were 
the actual Jews of the world, not not the Israel Israelites. They believe. Wait, what's the What's the name of that group again? Identity Christianity. Okay. And they felt that Jews were imposters and that they the Scandinavian nations were the tribes of Israel that went north and did they think they were one of the lost tribes? They they were one of the lost tribes. So they embraced this Christianity, uh, this uh, sect of it. And that was the rationalization, you know, for much of what they were doing. You know, we we are the uh, we are God's chosen people. Or well, once you designate yourself as God's chosen people. Apparently, you can do about anything you want to do. So that was where they began. Again, as I said earlier, they committed 240 federal crimes, killed five people, killed Alan Berg, and did a number of other things. So that was sort of my introduction. The book came out in 1987 to looking into people who embrace these. What, what's, the, what's the name of the book again? The book is Talk to Death The Life and Death of Alan Berg. And is, uh, is, is that the one that um, Oliver Stone did the movie? Yes, that's that's now the movie does not really follow the book that closely, but yes, it's based upon it. And Alan Berg was a, a, a talk show host, it was quite provocative. I, some consider him one of the first shock jocks, but he was very he was he was tackling social issues and he he was he was very argumentative on air and it eventually led to his assassination here in Denver in 1984. Right. Then I met Joyce in 1990 and in September of that year, there was a murder in Colorado Springs. This is a much smaller case, but it still fits into the pattern of what we're talking about. A woman, 28 year old woman named Jennifer Reale, who had two small children and a husband in the army in Colorado Springs, uh, got involved with a 32 year old man married who had three small children and he had kind of converted to evangelical Christianity a few years earlier, in some ways, just to get a job at the Prudential. They had a very strong, very fundamentalist Christian sect inside that Prudential office. And in order to get the job, he basically had to convert. So he did that. Then he meets Jennifer, starts up an affair, and starts using biblical quotations to draw her further in and to plant the idea within her that she should kill his wife. So this was the uh, case that I started uh, attending murder trials and legal proceedings with Steve. And um, eventually Jennifer Reale was convicted and so was Brian Hood, the, the man that convinced her that um, she would be forgiven for murder, but not for adultery. Now this is a very bright young woman and the girl next door never had a parking ticket. So it, it was a very intriguing case. And eventually we got to know Jennifer Reale when she was incarcerated in Canyon City. Um, it was unusual at that point for um, journalists to be allowed to interview uh, a defendant, particularly because the, her lawyers and, and most lawyers would not let their defendant be interviewed um, because of the appeals process. But she wanted to write a book, so her own retelling of, of why she did what she did. So we went to Canyon City Prison and and were and interviewed her. And we it was it was quite interesting because she never really owned up to the fact that she, you know, she would talk all around the subject, but when it came to the actual top point of her committing the murder, it was like the devil made me do it type of rationalization. She couldn't she how did how did she how did she kill her? She she dressed up in her army's her husband's army fatigues and stalked her at a the her the woman's name was Diane Hood. She was attending a lupus support meeting because she was suffering from that disease. So Jennifer Reale uh, stalked her and killed her in front of the support group meeting hall at night. Shot her and in her head she kept hearing the the. Uh, directives that Brian Hood, her lover, had given her, which was make sure you shoot her twice. You know, got to be, she's got to be dead. So she did that and she she dressed up, she walked like a man. In, in court, they made her recreate her how she stood and walked like a man, which was total humiliation for her. Yeah, yeah it was. So here we're, we're beginning to get very interested in this subject of where religion intersects with violence and how people are manipulated smart people, all types of people, people from all socioeconomic backgrounds. 
And that's why we kept, anytime we had a chance to find a, a story that dealt with that issue, we would go, you know, investigate it. Now, the best example, given what you said, in 2006, uh, in April, um, I had a book come out on the BTK serial killer case, and, and I was on CNN being interviewed for it, and Joyce was watching after that was on, and, and Warren Jeffs was a, the leader of what's called the FLDS, the Fundamentalist Latter-day Saints, which was a spinoff of the LDS Church in Salt Lake City. And he had just been placed on the FBI's 10 most wanted list. And she said, we should go down and look into this case. So uh, some background on it to fit it into these themes. In, in 1896, uh, Utah wanted to become a state of the United States. And the federal government said, you can become a state, but you have to give up polygamy. And so they had practiced that for decades. Well, since Joseph Smith. Yeah, the founder of <laughs> So, uh, so, so just to be clear, the, the Latter-day Saints and the Mormon Church, are they one and the same? They, they're one and the same. Okay. This was the FLDS. And so they didn't accept the fact that the federal government said this and they broke off and they set up uh, uh, two towns on the border of Utah and Arizona down south in, in Utah, uh, Colorado City on the Arizona side and Hill, Hilldale on the Utah side. Same, all, all one town, but in two different states set up that way in part to make the jurisdiction complicated and more, more difficult to pursue. But that wasn't the only place that, the, that these fundamentalist Latter-day Saints settled. They, they purposely sought out very, very remote uh, locations where they could sort of fly under the radar, radar and not be, you know, not be watched as closely. But this was a very big group. This was about 10,000 yeah. people and they lived, uh, as I said, on that border in 1928, they sort of established their, their uh, base there. And they practiced polygamy. They practiced uh, uh, underage marriage. Uh, I think they practiced, they definitely did later, taking uh, girls 13, 14, 15 across state lines. That's a violation of the Man Act in the United States for sexual purposes. Uh, and for the next, 25 years, the, the government entirely left them alone. The, the, the federal government, state government knew what was going on, but they didn't do anything. Then Arizona brought in a governor in 53 and he said, I'm gonna, this, I, the quote was almost like clean up this hornet's nest, something like that. So they did a federal raid and they thought that would be the solution. Where they took away the children. They took away, the, yeah. they split up the families. They and what year was this? Children. 1956. 1953. Oh, 53. And, and it backfired. The, the media came in and they showed these torn up families and crying children and fathers being toted off to jail. And, and none, of the, it, none of it was prosecuted and everything turned against uh, that move. So that's 1953. So what happened was, is as the 60s and the 70s came along and feminism sort of started to seep into our culture, women's rights, all of those things, some of the young women in that sect and a little background on them, many, most of them that we talked to had been sexually assaulted, either as children or teenagers. They were in families that sometimes I remember one family had uh, one father and 56 children and you know, 20 wives, however many wives. And when we went down to Colorado City, um, we, we, we would see these very long lines of women dressed up in looked like long prairie dresses with their the very distinguishable hairdos looked like from the 19th century, but they all had cell phones or, and it was a very surreal, strange place. And they were lined up at the local governmental agency to collect uh, food stamps and welfare because they had found a way of working the system. Um, they, they called it bleeding the beast, you know, the beast being the federal government. Right. So there was a lot of this going on and it, and it wasn't really being, it wasn't being watched by the, by the, by the government at, the, at this right. time. So some of the women that we interviewed uh, started to come forward in the 1980s and 90s and say, you're not enforcing the laws of the United States in, in the, inside the United States. This is completely outlaw behavior. This is crimes against children, crimes against women. Uh, all of the things they were forced 
to do. They weren't given driver's license, for example. So if they drove off of the compound, they would call law enforcement and say, such and such woman is driving without a license. They'd go arrest her. They had total control over the women and children. Well, the, the, the police agencies were also part of this sure. of the sex. So, and, and they were not allowed to watch television. They, they were taught in school there by Warren Jeffs, who was then a teacher. Um, so you, you that, just said something, you just said something very important. I don't want to gloss that over. Right. You said that the officers who are in charge of enforcing the law, we all know in this country that police officers are in charge for enforcing the law. They knew of it, but they weren't enforcing the law because they were actually part of this religious movement. Oh, absolutely. Exactly. Because when we first went down to investigate, um, we stopped at a place called the, the Hope Organization run by a woman named Elaine Tyler. Is that the name? Yeah. yeah. And she told us specifically, she was in another town a, a little, about maybe 30 miles away. And she told us, before you go into the town, make sure you follow all the, your P's and Q's and you stop at every stop sign and you don't do use, anything. Use your turn signal. Yeah, do everything correctly right because you will be watched. And as soon as we entered town, you know, we people started watching us, following us. And yeah, exactly. The police force was under the thumb of Warren Jeffs. They right. were all so. complicit. So is, is this the subject of when men become gods, that book? Yes, that's yes. correct. Yes. Okay. So all what we're all that they're talking about here, you could actually read about it in when men become gods. Okay, go ahead. And all all of the books are available at stevensingular.com. Yeah, and we're we're gonna put that on the um, okay. in the link below. Uh, <laughs> See that. So what happened was was that the um, Rulon Jess ran the sect, and he was Warren Jess' father, and he was a fairly reasonable guy. He lived out in the world and done business and all of these things. His son, Warren, came in, and Warren was an incredible extremist. And he took over after his father died and began making everything more strict inside the community. He, he rounded up all the dogs and killed them. He told the people they could only wear certain colors of clothing. He got rid of the internet, the, all forms of media. The kids could not play basketball, for, interest, for uh, example. And so it, it just kept getting worse and worse. And some of these stories leaked out. And then these women were coming forward, very courageous women coming forward and saying, this is what happened to me when I was young. And this has to stop. And then what happened was that Warren Jeffs was on the, uh, the FBI's 10 most wanted list. That's why they were doing a story on him on CNN, and I happened to see What that. was he most wanted for? Well, uh, basically, uh, crimes associated with polygamy. When these women were coming forward and say, he forced me to marry so-and-so, which was illegal. One of the women was 14 years old at the time, which is against the law in Utah. And uh, so remember that date of 1953 when that raid occurred. So the government didn't want to raid again. They thought they, that, that didn't work, what can we do? So in 2003, which is exactly 50 years later, they select this guy uh, named Gary Ingalls and they say, you go into that community and you infiltrate and you learn where the crimes are being committed, who's committing them, who are the victims, everything about it. And so during the writing of the book, I went down there many times and really sort of bonded with your angles. I thought he was a very brave, good guy to go in there and here are 10,000 people. Here's one guy in law enforcement who wasn't on the take, who wasn't in the sec. So when we first went down there, we in June of 2006, um, uh, Joyce and I, our 12 year old son, went to meet Gary Ingalls and he said, You want to ride around town? So we got in his, uh, in SUV. his SUV. And in the minute we pulled out, all the other cops in the city started tailing us and, and telling each other where we were and getting up on our tail and trying to do anything to intimidate him. Well, uh, and, and, and intimidating us, and, which they certainly yeah, did. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Uh, it was quite a show for our 12 year old son. So it was just, it was the environment. It, was, it felt like it could become very explosive, like a wake up uh, from 1993. Well, and at the time, they, it was unclear. When Warren Jeffs was on the run, they didn't know if the FLDS had stockpiled weapons at the edge of town 
And so they were afraid to go in because they didn't know if it'd be another conflagration, much like Waco. So, so every, everybody had to be very cautious in how they approached the situation. So in terms of their religion, there's one person who's the prophet and the prophet speaks to God and the prophet is the only person who speaks to God. And then God tells the prophet what to do. And then the prophet tells the people Jeff was doing things that had never happened in the community. He would take men uh, who were good, loyal people, productive, successful inside that community, and he'd say, you're, you're in violation of, of my rules or God's rules. And he would literally send them away and say, I want you to write down all your sins, and I want you to send me your sins, and then I'll look that over, and, I'll, and he'd say, you know, I'll forgive you. What he did was just break up their families, give that man's children to other families, fam people who were in his favor, take away his wives, spread them around the community. I mean, it was, it was the kind of thing I had never read about or uh, been exposed to at all. So all kinds of laws were being broken. But when a, a woman tried to come forward, her family members would say, you know, you're going to be uh, excommunicated if you, if you testify against him. They didn't have education, they didn't have money, they didn't have any resources. And most of them just said, well, I can't do that. So, so, an, ex, so an excommunication essentially was a, a death sentence because oh, yeah. oh yeah because they would be ostracized by other members of their families if they were thrown out of the church they were considered apostates and then no one was able to have anything to do with them no other family members uh, it was horrific and the young men of the town they called them the lost boys they were used for underage labor in and around Nevada and that the area of southern Utah. Northern Arizona, uh, where they all, where all those three states converge, and then it was because the young women were considered, you know, they were pretty much considered chattel at that point for the older men that wanted to take them as wives. The young men would just be discarded and driven out to uh, to Las Vegas and other towns yeah. where many of them turned to drugs. So then, in the midst of all, all of this, you know, Warren Jeffs is now on the ten most wanted list. He's on the run. Eventually, he gets caught in La coming out of Las Vegas. And he had been going to different um, communities where he was you know, sheltered. So, okay, then we fast forward to, I think it was well, 2000 let, with the raid at Elder Hill. Yeah, no, no, let's give him a little more background. So Gary Ingalls finally finds one young woman named Alyssa Wall, who at 14 had been forced into marrying her cousin, totally and completely against her will. And she finally said, I will, come forward and I will testify. And her mother turned against her and her sisters turned against her and the community turned against her. But she stood forward and, and eventually, uh, um, Jeff's went on the uh, 10 most wanted list, I think in March or April of 2006. And on August 28, 2006, he and his uh, a brother and one of his wives, he had maybe 80 wives, we don't, we don't know for sure. Uh, uh, were driving out of Las Vegas and part of their license plate was obscure. And this uh, state trooper saw him go by and he thought, well, should I let it go? Should I not let it go? And he stops him. And one thing leads to another and he realizes this guy's on the FBI's 10 most one of this. And for the first time in his life, Jeff is, I think, 50 years old at that point, And he, he now has to you know, he's arrested. He's never been uh, questioned on anything he's done. So it's quite a shock. But anyway, now he goes into the legal system and Alyssa goes into court and very bravely tells her story and, and all the things that have happened. And uh, then there's stories about other women and children and all of those things. Yeah, yeah. so what happened was, um, once he was, he went to trial in St. George. In St. George, Utah in 2007. But he, but the, but he had also established, unbeknownst to many people, in El Dorado, Texas, um, a, again, a very remote community where he had built and had his followers help build this giant white shrine, like almost, yeah, yeah like sort of like the one in Salt Lake, uh, a smaller version. And, um, Many of his followers went there because they weren't sure what was going to happen if, you know, now that he had been incarcerated. Yeah. 
Yeah, they had started going down. When the heat came on to them in, in Utah and Arizona, they said, we've got to have another outpost. So they went and bought, and all the money, people always ask about the money. They were very, very good at construction. They were extremely good at construction. And they were using 10 and 11 and 12 year old boys and not paying them so that they could always underbid for government contracts. So they were getting a lot of government contracts. So the federal government was actually financing them in, in some ways. And, uh, and that's, you know, that's how they got all the money. So they bought a huge ranch, 1700 acres down in Texas, and they built this big white temple and uh, that tried to set up operations there if something, you know, if things went down in, in Utah and Arizona. So on, in 2008, April, uh, a woman called and uh, the authorities in Texas and said, I've been abused by the people at this ranch. And it, the, the, the phone call was actually fake, but what she was saying was true in a lot of other circumstances. So what, so what happened with the 2007 trial though? The 2007 trial, he was convicted uh, of, uh, of bigamy and, and of uh, you know, forcing under, this underage girl into marriage, uh, which the, the legal uh, issue was called accomplice to rape. And so they, that conviction would be overturned on a technicality but he was in prison the whole time. Very complicated. But uh, so they they raided the ranch in in Texas. And so what year was that? In, in April of 2008. And, and this was when the book, When Men Become Gods, had already been released at this point. So Steve. Just, just being. Released. Yeah. And so Steve and a lot of other journalists rushed down to El Dorado, Texas, because it was all over the media. They were, you know, again, taking children away from the parents and putting them in foster homes. And it, it was it was a big deal um, in the media, internationally. I mean, as just, well. just to back up for just a second, again, just to reiterate, there were good people in that community and there were smart people in that community and there were pe successful people in the community. One of the men that I interviewed was a multimillionaire made from construction and other businesses. They were very good at business. So we don't want to portray them as all like, crazy nutty people. That's true. But when this leader comes in who has no boundaries, no scruples of any kind and starts committing serious crimes, a number of the men couldn't deal with what he was doing. They committed suicide. So they didn't murder people, but people ended up dead. So when they raided the ranch, they took away Four, I believe the number is 493 children. It was the largest child custody case in the history of the United States. They took them away from their families. Think back to, to 2000, 1953, which is again what the government did. They went in, they took the children, but in this case, they felt they were much more justified. And so I was in San Angelo, Texas in the spring of 2008. As this was unfolding, you, you, there are some lawyers here with us. So I'm trying to imagine that the structure yeah, that they built. The yeah, yeah, it's it. called mm -hmm. Yearning for Zion Ranch. And uh, so imagine having 493 clients in one courtroom. It, it was just a colossal event. Oh, wow. Ultimately, the, the government gave the children back to uh, the families. They couldn't prosecute given the legal situation. But when all this was unfolding, um, I had I told Stephen, I think it would be a good idea to send a copy or have St. Martin's Press, who, which was the publisher of the book, send a copy of it to Senator, then Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid, who, who he and his wife Landra had become converts to Mormonism. So just, just as one insertion there, his his son had wandered into that community one day just by accident, and they started treating him in this very hostile manner. The one in Texas or the one in Utah? In Utah. In Utah. In Utah. And that's how Harry Reid got into he had, he, had, he had heard about it, you know, being from Nevada. Of course, he was aware of it originally from Nevada. But so what happened was I just on a whim, I said, why don't we just send it to him? You know, this might interest him. Well, uh, surprisingly, one day when Steve was down in El Dorado, Texas, covering that, you know, scene that was unfolding, 
I got a very cryptic email on our through our website that said, call this number. And I recognized the two, I think it was 212, area, 202 area yeah. code. And it just, and the return address had Landra. And I didn't, it didn't, I hadn't connected the dots. So I called that number and they said, send, send it, you know, majority lead, leader Harry Reid's office. And I said, well, I just got this email saying to call this number. My, this is who I am. Immediately I was connected to Senator Reid. And he said very, in a very disarming way, he said, um, singular. Oh, I take singular for my allergies. And I, I, I was shocked. You know, he was, he was joking with that. I didn't even know the man from, so I thought, well, okay, if he's joking with me, then I might as well be forthright with him right back. So I said, so, so what do you think of the book? And he said, I think it reads like a novel. I need to speak to your husband immediately. He was a man of very, he was very brevity. He, be, he believed in brevity. He was not long-winded at all. I didn't, he was known for not liking long phone conversations, et cetera. So I gave him Steve's cell phone. He called him down in Texas and he told, and he said for you to write up. Yeah, he wanted me to write up uh, sort of uh, the crimes associated with polygamy, all the things that we're discussing. So I wrote that up and sent it to him. And then in about mid-July, he called and he said, we're going to have a, a uh, Senate Judiciary Committee hearing on crimes associated with polygamy, and we want you to testify. So did he come across like, as being offended in any way? Oh no, he wanted to help. Oh, no, he, he he was offended by he, he yeah. said he said like everybody else. He said I didn't know these people were doing all these things. I didn't know all these laws were being broken. So he said, you know, I wish you'd written your book sooner. And he thought that they were behaving like a mob, like mob bosses, exactly. which they were. You yeah. know, so that so we went to D.C. We, you know, the hearing was held. It was um, in, in, it was an incredible experience. Unfortunately, they want he wanted to have monies provided to look into the. It might have been a RICO prosecution, yeah. you know, a racketeering prosecution because there were going to be so many defendants and and you know, is there a pattern of corrupt activities, etc. This was in July of twenty oh, two thousand eight twenty. Oh, wait, they were trying to put the money together. And then in September of 2008, our economy crashed and it never got the funding to go forward. But what happened was that the authorities that were looking into that yearning for Zion Ranch that you put that the picture up of started finding these pictures behind the altar of, of young girls that they had used that altar for sexual purposes that Warren Jeffs was, you know, Having yeah, they, with they focused in on one case of an 11 year old girl that he married and apparently you know, had relations with uh, in this, the lower echelons of this temple. Um, a lot of, you know, outrageous materials like Richard Nixon, he, he couldn't keep himself from saving all of the souvenirs of his reign of power. So even though that other case had been overturned and he was probably going to be retried that sort of went away and they prosecuted him in Texas uh, in 2011. He was convicted and essentially is serving a life sentence. Yeah. Now, some of most of the people in that community uh, in Arizona and Utah, many of those people have broken away from that religion. One of the things they couldn't do is have private property. He, the church controlled all the property, all the finances. They broke that up. People can have their own houses, their own businesses, women have started to assume political positions in the community. So all of the light shining on that by many yeah. people helped. So even though the monies weren't, you know, they didn't come forth because of that Senate Judiciary hearing, just the media spotlight being showing all the raids and then what they subsequently found in the temple, it helped to shine a spotlight on these illegal activities so that now they were no longer able to operate under cover of darkness like they had been for many you know, decades. And many, many women came forward, yeah. mostly young. All right, so the, the, the question that's jumping in, I'm gonna get Dr. Cheney in a minute. The Warren Jeffs guy, he was the main one doing all of this, but was he the only one? Well, he wasn't the only one. He was the one making the rules for everybody and saying, I'm gonna break up this family, that family, I'm gonna kill all the dogs, all that was his. 
all of the men in the community, essentially, I don't I think all, but they were all polygamists. So they maybe had 10 wives, 20 wives, 50 wives. So it, it, it was totally widespread. And that's why they had to get rid of all the young men. And there just weren't enough women to go around. Under Did the these earth. other men get prosecuted, though? Because obviously they were breaking the law, too. Yeah, uh, there were lesser charges in several cases. Nothing as major as Jess, but there were several other trials that went on. And one, I recall, uh, they had a guy from multiple uh, polygamy charges and other things. And, you know, just like you see on television, the woman came into the courtroom who was the accuser and said, I, I refuse to testify. I mean, yeah, somebody got true. it happened a number of times. <laughs> So, but in terms of trying to undermine and sort of break up that sect, definite progress has yes, been made. Yes, absolutely. So did you say you had a question? That was, that was the question that I had um, oh, okay. with, with the other men, because as we know, bigamy is a crime. And if anyone is doing it, they should um, reasonably be prosecuted. But I was wondering why everyone was not. Dr. Cheney. I know you have a few questions and I also wanted to ask about some of the other groups that you might have dealt with is like Waco, but we'll get to that in a minute. Dr. Cheney. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Hello to you too. Hi. Hi. You all are great, good to hear from you. Thank you. I'm gonna go back a little bit and see what you think about this because such an interesting topic, religion. I, I, I was just, what came to my mind is historically I think about the mid 1800s and how the anti-slavery abolitionist John Brown relied on religious and cultural beliefs to classify good and evil deeds that he was involved in and to justify his acts of violence in, you would know about this, bleeding Kansas yeah, yeah, yeah. and elsewhere against those who demonstrated opposing views. So Brown is what? Anti-slavery and the opposing views would be pro-slavery. So you got that going on in Bleeding Kansas and all that. Anyway, Brown's goals, goal as we can come to a conclusion, was to end slavery pretty much, using religion to justify his acts. Now, what was the goal of the men who become gods in your book, who also use religion? And I'm trying to, I'm trying to suggest that it's not a new phenomenon. That's Absolutely right. not a new phenomenon. I mean, it goes as far back as human history. I mean, look at the Crusades. Look at the Spanish Inquisition. I mean, there's always, I always refer to that uh, song by Bob Dylan with God on our side. You can always justify what you're doing if you, if you convince people that God is on your side. True. From a legal perspective, which you all could address, it's it's where you cross the line of religious freedom, as we spoke about earlier, and criminal behavior. I mean, that's where you always have to make that distinction. And go ahead. And and there's a fine line with that. If someone has this, if we look at the COVID mandate that the government has passed, but if you have a sincere belief that the God that you worship does not want you to inject a foreign substance into your body. Who is to tell whether or not that's a sincere belief or you're just trying to skirt a law. So it, it is, there's a fine line when it comes to law and religion. And I think in this example with men become gods, you see people actually breaking the law because maybe it's a sincere belief. Who knows? Right. Well, I, I think it could, could be considered a sincere belief, certainly by some, but, I mean, like, don't Christian scientists also believe that you, you don't take medicine or you don't go to, you know, traditional doctors? But as, as regards to your COVID question, at what point does, is it the, the benefit of the group to not have someone that's, that doesn't believe in vaccinations infect other people? I mean, that's a really... Yeah, that's what, very subtle. What if I have a sincere belief that I need to drive 120 miles an hour? Right. Yeah. And, and, and that's where the law... I have a very yeah. sincere belief about yeah. that. And that's what the case with Reynolds versus the, um, the United States is they said that you could have a sincere belief, but if your belief starts to hurt other people, then yeah. we have to step in and curtail yeah. 
exactly. that belief. And, and there's other religions that believe about tr blood transfusion and they would rather their child die, but the, the, the courts will come in and say, well, wait a minute. But then again, it has to get to that point, right? So, but, but go ahead, Dr. Cheney, go ahead with the next question. Okay. In your book, When Men Become Gods, chapter two, you cover sex and terrorism. And I do have the book. Okay. okay. Hold, hold that up again, Dr. Cheney. All righty. A real good topic. This is really a page turner. <laughs> so in your book, When Men Become Gods, chapter two, you cover sex and terrorism and how the women suffered in fear and their struggles in the name of the intersection of religion and violence. I just came across this thing about seed barriers. And perhaps you could talk about that. Can you describe what went on in the celestial marriages? You pretty much have in your chapter on sex and terrorism. And how did they know that there was a problem? How did the people know that there was a problem as they were so indoctrinated uh, early on in their lives? So it's, it's, it's what we do. So how do you know to step forward that there is a problem? Well, I, it's an interesting question because what we found in investigating and interviewing many of these women from these groups was that, and as a woman, I, you know, I told C, we need to look at this story because I think women are going to find this very interesting because, partly because if you're, grow, if you're born into a sect or a cult, how do you know what's wrong, what's not wrong? If you're constantly indoctrinated, of course you're going to believe that that's the truth, right? Mm -hmm. But I, what I found, what I gleaned from our experience in investigating it was there's always people within men and women in these groups and these cults these, that will push back. There's always the rebel. There's always the person that's going to want to think for themselves. And that's what happened in, in Colorado City, Utah. There were people like um, Flora Jessups, right. and she started helping other young women get out and escape. They'd have to go under cover of darkness because the men wouldn't let them leave town. So I always found it so interesting, just from a sociological perspective, that there was always a person that will push back in these situations. And some of the world, the outside world, it was leaking in. I mean, there was a lot going on in the society and the culture that about the empowerment of women. And they were, before Warren just came along, they were exposed to media, internet, outside forces. So it was a gradual evolution. You know, they just said, like Joy said, there's always somebody who breaks off. And, and it just took one or two at the beginning. And then they began to find allies in the, in the outside in the media world in, in some cases people who were reporting on yeah. this and exposing the crimes and giving the women a voice, uh, all of those things. So, yeah. All right, Dr. Okay. Cheney, do you have another one I'm about to get? Well, this is good, um, still into this one. Okay. This seed barriers business, it's my understanding from just hearing recently that <clears throat> um, I guess the person is Warren Jeff actually has selected 15 or more men to impregnate women and the husbands of these individuals would watch and hold their hands while the men had sex with them. Are you familiar with some of that? I didn't hear that particular story. Okay, I, I just heard Maybe true, I mean, we only got a portion of what went on, but. Yeah, and basically the last one, Will you tell us about the pattern of leadership, and you pretty much have, which follow, which, and what follower facts enable those leaders to become godlike figures? What do we do? What are, what are the people doing to enable them to do what they do? Well, there seems to be something in a in people to trust authority. You know, we, we, we struggle with this in, in all kinds of ways. Uh, but that was essentially what that culture was based on. There were seven men in the priesthood originally, seven because it's an odd number and that they, when they voted, there was a somewhat of a checks and balances system. 
But that began to fall apart when Rulon just came in and then completely when, when Warren came in. And I mean, you, when in interviewing these people, especially the men, the men really touched me because they were, they seemed like decent people. And they just trusted, they trusted that this authority figure is speaking to God, is getting messages that are celestial. Yeah. And it's, some of it was based on the Book of Mormon, not, not all of it. But, you know, when, when you have that kind of conviction and that trust, you can be severely abused. And, I mean, <laughs> and I remember when, you know, some, many of the houses had pictures of Jesus Christ and they had Warren Jeffs right next to him. So he was right, right there. You know, that was their direct link to the divine. Well, he was the spokesperson. The, the strange thing was, was that after the 1953 raid, they always said outside forces are going to come in and, and, and ruin us. They're going to try and destroy us. You know, as they're looking outside, this monster is growing right inside their community. He was born in the 50s. He abused women and children when he was a teacher at his father's compound and outside Salt Lake City before they went to Southern Utah. And again, it's that thing where you're looking in the wrong direction and you're not seeing the monster that's right in front of you. And by the mm -hmm. time you make that recognition, mm -hmm. like the men who had gone away and confessed their sins, they could never come back. Mm -hmm. It took years for them to catch up with, this is a world-class psychopath. This isn't a religious leader. This is person is psychotic and, and, will, and will do anything. And, you know, that's that tragic part of the story because he got away with so much abuse for so long. And if these women hadn't come forward and said enough is enough, it might still be going on. And then, of course, in prison, he, he came out and said, you know, oh, but by the way, now I'm not the prophet. You know, I'm not the prophet. So, you know, once in prison, he all kept of a changing sudden, his mind. He yeah. tried to kill himself in prison. He might have had a some sort of revelation. We don't know, but he's wasting away in Texas now, which is where he belongs. To um, address also to your question, Dr. Cheney, I'm reading this book called Influence, and it talks about, it, there seems to be a psychological um, phenomena when you do certain things for someone, it opens them up to want to do things for you and listen to whatever you say. And there's a woman that the author quotes in the book that was during the Jim Jones era. And she said the reason why she did not drink the Kool-Aid is because she would not allow him to help her with food and other things when she needed it. But apparently he was helping people, giving people things that they needed. And yeah. when that time came to drink the Kool-Aid, they were all for it because of what he had done before. So there's a psychological element there when you get these people in power to do what they do. And then with the law, it gets so sticky again because of what our country was founded on. John Salati. Well, we, I, I want to sort of jump us forward uh, a little bit then. We, we've talked about what's gone on in, the, in Utah and various places over the, gosh, over 70 years now. Um, let's bring it up to where we are now and your topics about religion and violence and religion and terrorism and things like that. And what are the things that we should be looking at today? Where, where are those themes that you've studied in depth are you seeing, oh, gee, we talked about this in this book and this book and this book, and boy, here it is again. And people really need to be keeping their eyes open for this now. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I started in 1984 writing about Alan Berg and the Order, and I just heard echoes of it, you know, throughout the January 6, 2001 uh, events at the Capitol. The same sort of, in some ways, the same sort of mindset. Some of it is religious or so-called religion. Some of it is is politics. The thing, the thing I find about all of these things, and it's a somewhat different topic, but that people just people latch on to these things in order to have some kind of identity. In other words, I don't think they have a clear. I don't think they have a clear political agenda. It certainly was, was not true for the order. But what they do psychologically is begin to identify themselves as victims. In the case of the order, they co-opted all of the language of the 60s from the, you know, from uh, minority people, women, gay people, and they used it 
to recruit as we are a class of victims. And I, I see the same thing in those events. And it's, it's very dangerous thinking because once you identify yourself as a victim, you can do just about anything to anybody. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as Professor Cheney was saying, I mean, we, you know, we're not here to condemn religion. Religion has done and did a lot of good in the civil rights movement. It's done a lot of good in the 19th century. But you have, you know, you, you have to be able to make distinctions and think for yourself. And again, that, that's sort of a basic- And that's, and that's a good point. We are not begrading, belittling religion. We're not narrowing out anyone's religion. Please keep those emails at bay. We're just <laughs> educating yeah. people. No, but we're it, just talking about where religion intersects with violence. But anything, right. anything can be abused. Yeah. Political power sure. can be abused. Yeah. Just can, religion can be abused. And <clears throat> as I see more, as I see people, you know, gravitate toward these sort of movements that are based on unrealities, that's what's disturbing to me. I mean, there was no stolen election. You know, that, that did, that's an event that didn't happen. People are building their lives and taking actions and creating movements on things that never happened. That's a different psychological state. If you go back to, to what we talked about last week, which is another level of it, people made careers and wrote books and did seminars on what I absolutely fervently believe is an event that never occurred. Yeah. That's a psychological break from reality. I think that's part of what we're dealing with in our culture. I think that's what January 6th was largely about. And that's a whole other level of psychological examination and emotional disturbance. That's what I really think ties these, these things together. Because you have to stop and sort of think about it at that level. What if you're analyzing events that didn't occur? That's essentially what the kinds of people like Warren Jeff sell. And the injustice yeah. comes in when the group of people who know this, they exploit it. So if you have a religious leader and he or she knows that what they're feeding them is wrong, but they do it anyway, that's the injustice. Go ahead, John. <laughs> I, I think it's, it's this idea of taking on either trappings. Yeah, I don't, I totally agree with the concept of what we're just saying about not, we're not denigrating religion because what's happening in most of these instances is are people who are taking the trappings of religions or the symbols of religion and then turning them to their own devices for their own benefit. Uh, and that, that is a perversion, that is an injustice of sorts in and of itself. And so that I see is the theme from the singulars that we need to be thinking about is how are symbols, how are things that we normally might find in the religious sphere being used or abused now in ways that are again, misleading people and creating greater disharmonies in our society. And those, those are the things that we can learn from their work and their reporting and make use of right now and in the coming years. You know, it's not and, just, oh, well, remember this happened then. Oh yeah, absolutely. You know, it's still happening now. Absolutely. And, and keep, always keep your eye on criminal behavior because that's where the dividing line is. You're free to believe anything you want and pretty much say what you want. But we've seen case after case in these religious um, or some of these high profile religious organizations where criminal, pro, criminal behavior comes into play. And that's the thing you have to, I think, keep your eye on. Well, and to play off your January 6th theme, that whole thing was say, ginned up, as you might say, on the, on the victimization. Oh, the lie that this was taken from us. And from that comes your point. Once you believe you're a victim, then anything starts it's to justified. become plausible. It's just, and it's justified. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Once when you believe you're a victim and once when you believe that you've been sanctioned by God himself, yes. you could literally do anything. Yes. 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 The book is called When We Become Gods. So when men become when men become gods. And that title in and of itself is riveting. Just 
it could, that's a scary thought when you think of man and then whatever idea you have of God and you say when men become gods, oh my well, God. And his subtitle is important too. It's Mormon polygamist Warren Jeffs and the, wi- the women who fought, fought back. back. That was important that the, there are women that fight back. There are always somebody that fights back against despots, against, you know, tyranny. That's yes. what yeah, we were trying exactly. to do. Exactly. Yes. Dr. Cheney, can you hold up the book one more time? Mm-hmm. And it's at um, Stephen's website. It's stephensigler.com, right? Right. Yeah. S-T-E-P-H-E-M. Yes. And we'll make yeah. sure and put it down yeah. on in the mm-hmm. link below. Thank you too so much again for coming and sharing this information with us. It's, it's such an important subject. It's information that people need to hear and people in other countries now could hear and know about something that's going on here in our country. Well, thank you for having thank us. You for having it's a great me. discussion. Very, very great. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Cheney, John Salati. Thank you once again. And we'll see you all again next week. Bye-bye. All right. Bye. Thanks for watching our video. For experienced legal services in Washington, D.C., Alabama, and Washington State, visit our website at remuslaw.com or call us at 1-833-329-1799. When someone goes through a divorce, they lose their best friend. They lose their house. They lose their children. Any time away from your child is a loss. Let's face it, divorce kills. The average cost in the United States for a divorce is $13,000. It's not uncommon for divorce to cost well into the hundreds of thousands of dollars. At Remus, we take into consideration you, the divorcing spouse, your property, your money, and your children. We assist clients in directing them to therapy, mentorship programs, savings. We mitigate the cost of divorce to keep your expenses down. We look out for the client holistically. I came to Remus Law seeking a divorce. Salon listened to me. I told him my story. When he mailed me a copy of the complaint, which summarized my story, he was able to say exactly what I had been feeling for so many years. When my husband was served with the complaint, he came to me with tears in his eyes. He said he didn't know this is how I was really feeling. He asked if we could try again. At Remus, we do all that we can for our clients. Wait a little bit longer. Wait a little, we'll be coming around again. Cause you know we're stronger than we were when you and I began. I don't know what's harder, holding on and letting go. I don't know if we ought to, know if we ought to know. I don't know. The lessons taught in the adventures of Uncle Billy and Ross are lessons that adults learn late in life. Some never learn it. I will recommend every parent, every young person, every adult, read this book. But more importantly, apply the lessons.